Well, good evening. Thank you so much for being here tonight with us online. Good evening and welcome to tonight's special presentation. My name is Evan O'Brien and I'm the creative manager here at the Boston Tea Party Ships and Museum. And it is my great honor and privilege to welcome you to tonight's special presentation, a global perspective on the Boston Tea Party, the role of the East India Company presented by Lena Batnagar. Lena, are you there? Hi, I'm here. Nice to see you, Evan. Great. Thank you so much for being here tonight. I can't wait to get into this amazing topic. Now, if you are all new to our online content, or if you've never visited us here in Boston before, our museum tells the story of the Boston Tea Party of 1773, an event that we believe to be the single most important event leading up to the American Revolution. And before I introduce Lena officially, I'd like to remind all of you watching here tonight, and there's over a hundred of you registered for tonight's webinar. That's amazing. Thank you so much. We are only a few days uh, beyond 50 days from the 250th anniversary of the Boston Tea Party. So pressure is on us and all of our partner organizations to deliver an amazing commemoration in just 53 days. Of course, this will take place on Saturday, December 16th, 2023. And there are many associated events that will feature a grand scale reenactment of the tea crisis of 1773. The evening will feature programming in historic Faneuil Hall, the Old South Meeting House, an outdoor performance at Downtown Crossing, a rolling rally of many thousands of people to the waterfront, and of course, a dramatic recreation of the destruction of the tea along Boston's Harbor Walk. This citywide series of events is being produced in partnership with over a dozen different organizations, including the City of Boston, America 250, Revolution 250, Meet Boston, our colleagues at Revolutionary Spaces, and many others, all working together to create a signature commemorative year of collaborative and inclusive programming, talking all about the history of the Boston Tea Party and its lasting legacy in a modern world. And of course, we are extremely grateful for all of our partners and sponsors for their support throughout this commemorative year. And yes, you even see the East India Company logo on that list of sponsors there and partners. And we'll be talking more about the East India Company tonight. <clears throat> now, at the conclusion of tonight's presentation, I'll be sharing with you more information about the anniversary and how you can participate in this historic event, even if you cannot make it to Boston for December 16th, 2023. And for, of course, more on the upcoming commemorations, you can be sure to visit bostonteaparty250.org. And now, welcome again, Lena, uh, for tonight's presentation. I'm thrilled to welcome Lena Buttnager this evening. <clears throat> she is an economist and a writer. Lena is an economist at the U.S. Treasury Department and volunteers as an ambassador at the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of American History. She's also the best-selling author of The Tea Merchant, which we sell here in our gift store at the museum and proud to do so, a historical fiction novel leading up to the Boston Tea Party that explores the hidden threats the British East India Company brings from Bengal to the American colonies. She has a master's in international economic policy from Columbia University and a bachelor's in finance from New York University. So please join me in welcoming Lena. Thank you so much. Take it away. Thanks, Evan. I'll get started with my presentation. So I'll just share the screen. One second. All right. So first of all, thank you to everyone who is joining me tonight. I'm very excited to provide a global perspective on the Boston Tea Party. I hope that it will be a new kind of conversation for everyone. And with over 100 people registered, I hope to hear from you at the end of the presentation as well to see how this global perspective might have changed your impression about the Boston Tea Party. As Evan was saying, a lot of us are first introduced to the Boston Tea Party as the single most important event leading up to the revolution. As someone growing up in Massachusetts, as an Indian American growing up in Massachusetts, I'd always heard about the Boston Tea Party and was intrigued by the East India Company, but it was only fairly recently that I realized that the links between the East and the West are actually much closer than we originally think about. And when you think about the Boston Tea Party with this global perspective, 
it actually raises the stakes of what might have happened in America. What could have happened if there had not been a Boston Tea Party? What would have been the future for global history? It all comes down to the Boston Tea Party when you finally get a moment to pause and think about the role of the East India Company. And you might be wondering why I, an economist and a novelist of historical fiction, might be sharing these with you. Uh, so first of all, in my two disciplines, I'm very much focused on what makes people tick. Why do they behave the way they do? What motivates them? How does that change society? And then also as an Indian American, growing up in Massachusetts, I saw the revolution all around me, but I never really felt a connection. And it was only on a family trip to India where I was in Calcutta, which was the home base of the East India Company, when I realized that this was a familiar name, but I had only really cared about it in the Boston context and never really thought about the true linkages between East and West. So what I'm hoping for tonight is to provide an overview of some of the facts about you know, the Boston Tea Party and the East India Company, and also describe a little bit about the truth in fiction and how historical fiction is a really powerful medium for us to talk about new kinds of events in a different perspective, in a new light. And then I'd like to leave some time at the end for a discussion. And I do mean a true discussion, especially with so many people who have registered. There have been many reasons why we're all here today. We all come from different walks of life, different studies, different backgrounds. And I'd be curious to hear from you how the talk tonight may have changed your perception. And I also hope to leave you with some answers, but I do also hope that you will have many more questions. And these are the kinds of questions that will challenge you as you think about American history, as you think about global history and even current affairs today. So that when we go and celebrate 250th anniversary of the Boston Tea Party this December and of the revolution in the coming years, we come to it with a new perspective, with a global perspective, which allows us to think critically about these issues. So with that, let's begin. So just to make sure that we're all on the same page, uh, the Boston Tea Party did take place on a cold, rainy night back in December of 1773. And just a quick overview for those of you who may not be that familiar with the event. It was led by the Sons of Liberty, and they were a group of colonial Americans who were protesting the continual infringement of their rights by the British government. So by December 16th, they had had enough. They marched down to Boston Harbor, disguised themselves as Mohawk Indians, and dumped 350 chests of, of East India Company tea, nearly 350 chests. And this was a massive number. It was about 100,000 physical pounds of tea that they dumped into the harbor. And it was worth about 10,000 pounds sterling in damage. And today, that would be worth about $2 million in damage. And of course, the repercussions from the event were significant. It spurred a crackdown by the British government. It led to a series of acts that continually escalated over the next couple of years, so that by 1775, the American Revolution would begin in earnest. And you might be wondering, for such a drastic event to happen, what would have caused it? What would have triggered the Boston Tea Party? So I'll begin by kind of unpacking some of the myths that we think about with the Boston Tea Party. And some of the myths are pretty clear in this picture that I have on the screen right now. This is a pretty common picture that we see when we think about the Boston Tea Party. It's a bunch of colonists, you know, screaming, shouting, uh, egging on some colonists, shirtless, dressed up as Indians who are literally just using their hands to lift off chests of tea into the harbor. Obviously, this was not what you might think would happen in December in Boston. It's much too cold for anyone to actually be dressed like that. And the atmospherics were completely different. It was a solemn affair. It was a quiet affair. Everyone knew they were taking on a huge risk. And hundreds of people were participating and thousands of people in Boston were watching on. The entire city had come together to take part and witness this event. So what might trigger the people of Boston in 1773 to move on to such drastic measures? And usually when we think about the Boston Tea Party, when we first learn about it, it's usually in primary school when we have very limited attention spans. And they just kind of tell us, oh, it had to do with taxes and they didn't want to pay them because they didn't feel that they were having the right representation in parliament in London. And so when 
the tea came and they had to pay taxes on it. They didn't like it. And so they just dumped it all in the harbor. And that's partially true. Um, there was a tax on tea, but the tax on tea had actually been around since 1767. So when you realize that they're protesting something that's been around for seven years, you'll wonder what might have changed in 1773 for this to take place. And to do that, we do need to step back and think about what was going on in the British Empire more broadly. So to begin, let's just take a look at the British influence in the 18th century around the world. And you can clearly see that British influence is definitely concentrated in the Western Hemisphere. The footprint is definitely largest in North America. And after a few early hiccups in the early 1600s, when different companies were coming, coming to Virginia and Massachusetts thinking they could find silver and gold, they finally found out they actually had fur and lumber, um, access to sugar and tobacco, which was actually profitable for them. So they had been around for over 150 years learning how to make a trade. And that was the British government that had been very involved in the colonies at this point. But things start to change by the middle of the 1700s. And you see British influence is starting to expand around the world. And you can see it's starting to pick up in the Indian subcontinent as well. It's not as large as you might think. You might have heard a phrase when people talk about the British Empire, that the sun never set on the British Empire. That's not the case just yet. In the middle of this 18th century, it was much more sparsely dispersed throughout the world. And I should also correct myself, when I'm talking about the British Empire, it's not really the British Empire whose influence you're seeing here, despite the citation. It's actually the sphere of British influence. And whoever is in the East is actually not a government. It's a private corporation. And that corporation, you might expect to be, the British East India Company. And it was a huge, massively significant corporation at that time, it's by the middle of the 1700s. From the middle of the 1700s to the early 1800s, it accounted for roughly half of global trade. So this was a magnificently huge and significant entity for the British Empire. And as you can see from this Indo-European style painting, it's a pretty good self-reflection of how the company thought of themselves. Uh, first thing that will stand out is how large the person is in the middle and the outfit that they're wearing. And it kind of describes that this is not a normal company. This is not your normal kind of corporation. It was a large paramilitary force with a significant influence around the British Empire and had even the right to wage war. So when you think about the British Empire and how it links up with the British East India Company, it's much more nuanced when you think about the, the unrest that's happening in Boston. Yes, there were colonial Americans who were frustrated with their lack of representation in Congress, but the Boston Tea Party was actually a destruction of private corporate property. And when you're thinking about the company's property, it's no small player that they're acting up against. So you might wonder, how might a company have become so large and significant? And for here, it's also helpful to step back a little bit further back in time. So the East India Company was actually not the first player in the game. That actually goes to Portugal. And in the late 1400s, Vasco da Gama found a sea route from Europe all the way to India. And that changes the way the entire European continent starts interacting with the rest of the world. And Portugal is the first to really establish a trading base with India from the European side. And over the course of the 1500s, the Portuguese are making significant strides and the British are watching on. And finally, by the late 1500s, Britain literally finds its sea legs when it defeats the Spanish Armada. And they get into the game in 1600 when the East India Company is formed. And soon after that, the Dutch and the French also get into the game. But what's different about the East India Company it's again, it's a private corporation, unlike the other companies that had some kind of affiliation with the government, with the monarchies. Here, it's private shareholders who are running the show. And when you have private individuals, their motivations are completely different. They are thinking about their own, their own shareholder profit maximization. They're not thinking about stakeholders. They're not thinking about good governance or administration. They want to make a buck and make it as efficiently for themselves as possible. 
And so the tactics they took were pretty unusual for a corporation. Uh, yes, they were aggressive, but they also had zero qualms in looting from the locals in India as they were making their gains. They were using those gains to literally buy seats in parliament. So the links between the company and the crown start to become tighter over the course of the 16 and 1700s. And it's a deeply fascinating and enticing opportunity for a lot of British citizens at that point because there was tons of upside for them and they could capture it all. And there was also a ton of risk, but they would have to be willing to take it. So if you were an investor in the company, you could lose your entire fortune. But if you really wanted to make your way and sign up to become an officer, it sounded great, but you could lose your life along the way. So what would entice someone to take on such a risk? What was the big idea of going to the East? And to help me understand what might happen there, you have to think about the East Indies in the context of the global empire at that point. So the global economy had been kind of new and underdeveloped in the West. But when you think about the East Indies, it had been thriving for thousands of years. Uh, the East Indies was definitely not the new world. And in fact, at that point, it was being led through the Mughal Empire, which was at its peak in the 1600s. And yes, the name Mughal might sound a bit like Mongol for you. Um, that's because they were direct descendants of Genghis Khan and those leaders. But they were also connected to different empires around the Asian and Middle Eastern region, including in Persia. So when you have these crossing of cultures coming together, these different rulers blending and advancing together, there was significant progress in Asia, particularly in the Indian subcontinent. They were highly advanced in mathematics, in science, in art, design, textiles, and cooking. The Taj Mahal looked as it does today. It was completed in the middle of the 1600s. So when the East India Company is going out, they see these riches that they can literally bring, bring back in their pockets. Uh, the French had been bringing back diamonds at that point, including what we now know as the Hope Diamond. But despite all of that being the shiny uh, object that we might want to think that of people capturing, the most valuable at this time were the spices that people could get in the East Indies. And it wasn't just so that food could taste better, bland European cooking could now become fusion. That wasn't really the, the key driver for going after these spices. It was critical to have access to spices to preserve your food so that when you're a European going through a harsh winter or a prolonged winter, you will be able to have your meats throughout the season. At the same time, the spices were used for medicinal purposes and suddenly you're able to extend your lifespan by having just access through these spices. So you can see that these spices were really a key driver for European eastward expansion. And to give you a sense of just how much spices could buy, uh, I'll, I'll show you a picture of Portugal. Now remember, Portugal was the first one to really get their foothold in trading uh, from a European perspective in India. And here is a picture of the Geronimos Monastery. It's along the Lisbon waterfront. It's about three football fields long, and it was built over the course of the 1500s. And you can see there are some people scattered there so you can get a sense of scale. So it is as massive as it looks. And when you go inside, the, the grandeur doesn't stop. There. There's marbles, there's carvings everywhere. Um, and this was all being built throughout the 1500s based on part from a pepper tax that the Portuguese were charging, just a 5% tax on the spices that they brought back from India. So you can bet in Britain, when they finally feel confident in being able to navigate on the water, they wanted a taste of this as well. And there was more than enough to go around. When you think about how wealthy the Mughal era India had been, uh, the Mughal Empire was around for about a few hundred years, but India had been wealthier long before they even came. And you can see in this chart that kind of depicts economic growth and the share of world GDP by different empires over time. And you can see the orange section, that is all driven by the different Indian entities. It's not just one era, not one empire at a time. And at their peak, they controlled about 25% of global GDP. Next to them in red, which obviously we can't ignore, is China. So when you see the Europeans looking east, they're looking to both India and China as a way to access trade. 
Unfortunately for them, it was much harder to trade with China. Uh, they didn't really want anything that the West had to offer. They were they're were just pretty good with all of their luxuries and their teas and their porcelain and their paper. Uh, so they didn't really want to trade with the West unless they could get their goods traded for silver. Uh, the Indians were a little bit different. Uh, the, the European forces had started making deals and opening up trading ports with the Indians earlier on in the course of the 16 and 1700s. So it was an opportunity for Europeans to transact with Indians, not only to, to gain their own access to the trade, but also use it as a medium to trade with China. And what's interesting, if you look at the little section between 1700 and 1820, is how that orange section is shrinking. And there's a whole field of study of why the Mughal Empire might be weakening at that time. Um, but for our perspective, and, and stepping back and thinking about British citizens all over the world, including in America, this actually presents an opportunity and what might Americans might want to do so they can access this part of the trade. So the timing for this actually couldn't have been better for the company. If you think about where the Mughal Empire had been at the start of the 1700s, they were a dominant force. But you can start seeing in this chart on the left over here that Europeans were starting to make headways in key ports. You can see the Portuguese, the French, the Dutch, and the Danish are all starting to make their entry into India. And by 1750, when the, when the military power of the company gets stronger, it's a very different empire that they're dealing with. The Mughals have been basically relegated to just these dark brown purple splotches of the empire. And you can see they're concentrated in Bengal. And Bengal is relatively small on the map, but it's actually one of the wealthiest areas of the Indian subcontinent. It's extremely fertile land, can grow tons of cotton there, which is critical for the textile industry. There's a large bay, which allows for easy trading with the rest of the world. So it was still a lucrative opportunity, particularly when you think about how the Mughal Empire was declining at that point. And then you see with at this chart on the right, it's not just the Mughal Empire, but there's also a growing sphere of influence from other European powers. The French are coming in as well. So the Brits are watching all of this. They're seeing the Indian subcontinent as an opportunity to move their fields of warfare and their theaters to the Indian subcontinent as well. And they become much more involved in local politics. And all of this comes to the perfect moment in the company under Robert Clive. And there is a great picture here of Robert Clive having his moment, uh, which really changes the whole scope for the company. So Robert Clive, just a little bit of context, he was leading the East India Company in the middle of the 1700s. Uh, he was a shrewd military tactician, but he was also extremely aggressive. Some experts have called him an unstable genius. Uh, the family he had at home was not very supportive for him, but he found a family in the company and in warfare. And through him, the company took on a new form in India. The first key turning point that he brought about was in 1757. That was the Battle of Plassey. And that was technically a war between the company and some local rulers in India. But actually, those local rulers were French allies. And what that did was establish the British East India Company as the dominant European force on the East Indian continent, and then also allowed the company to put in puppets into the government. And then the second major turning point is what we see here in 1765. And this is the Battle of Buxar. And what you see in the middle here is a Mughal ruler handing Clive a sheet of paper. And this paper is called a Divani, which basically means that the company, and not the rulers themselves now, have the right to administer revenue collection. So if you think about it from a company's perspective, they now have control over the people and the money. And this, you would think, might be a lot of work for a private corporation to take on. They might want to get some help from actual people who know a thing or two about running a country, but they don't. Uh, so they continue running this as if they are fully maximizing their own shareholders and still operating properly as a private company. So as you might expect, this brings a fundamental change to India. Um, as you can see where we were in 1751, where the Mughals had been, that's where the company comes in. So by 1765, the East India Company has now established a foothold in some very lucrative territories around the Bay of Bengal. And this is a very rich area of how 
uh, the East India Company has changed Indian history, um, but it's hardly ever studied in how this shapes American history as well. And I'd like to you to keep this map from 1765 in mind, because this map is not just a reflection of opportunity for the British. You have to keep in mind that in America, the colonists at that point still thought of themselves as Englishmen, as British. So the gains that the company was making in India were their gains too. So they didn't have to build a ship and travel around the world to get access to Indian spices or indirect trade to China through India. They could just transact with the company. And so what this meant is that Americans were able to be exposed to the upsides of the company. It also meant that they were exposed to the downsides. And so we'll come to that one a little bit later. Um, but first I'll speak a little bit more about all the different kinds of upsides that were available to the Americans and how the Americans started interacting with the company. So when we're thinking about the company's gains in Bengal, they're being able to access key commodities, textiles, spices, saltpeter, and opium. That's another footnote to keep in your minds for later on tonight. And what they're able to do is sell those commodities and earn silver. Remember, the Chinese didn't want Western goods, they wanted silver. Um, and so now they're able to access the silver and buy a key commodity from China, which is tea. And that's the thing that brings us back to the Boston Tea Party tonight. As we're thinking about the demand that's growing in colonial America at this time, just think about how much silver would have been required to, to meet that demand. It was an insatiable appetite. You think about how we're so dependent on caffeine today. Imagine colonial Americans who had never had anything like it before. Uh, so suddenly the East India Company needs to be able to procure tea and send tons of it back to the American colonies and everywhere else that there was British influence. So they would capture the tea from the Chinese, buy it from them, auction it off in London and sell it onwards, and then use those profits to reinvest in India and reward their shareholders. And you can see in this little section on the bottom left here, this is where Americans really start to get involved in the tea trade. And you'll notice when you're thinking about these particular people, it's not just the consumer that we're going to focus on. If you think about how colonial America interacted with the company, they're involved at a commercial level, at a very intimate basis. So you have colonial American traders in London. They're the ones actually at the auction, buying the tea and then selling it back to traders and shippers also in colonial America. It should be no surprise that there were a lot of families who were involved on both ends of those transactions. It was simple, but it also meant that their interests were doubly tied to the company. And you also have to think about the tea itself. It has to make its way over the Atlantic somehow. It doesn't just fly over. So with colonial America having a huge shipping industry and a shipbuilding industry, merchants in particularly Northern Massachusetts and the shipbuilding industry in that whole New England region were also closely linked up with the East India Company. We have a couple pictures down here of two key ship owners, Roach and Roe, who we'll hear about a little bit later when we think about the Boston Tea Party but also just realize that they are also transacting with the company for their contracts. And then not to be undone, colonial American politicians were also influenced by the company. So if you think about the role of the company, it made for a strong source of revenue and tax revenue for the British crown. And those revenues directly fed the wages of the royal governors back in the colonies. So it made sense for Thomas Hutchinson, who's on the left over here, a royal governor of Massachusetts to want to make sure that the company is strong so that the overall British empire and its coffers can be strong. And interestingly enough, the East India Company creates a shadow economy as well. So there was a ton of smuggling that took place in colonial America. There was some obviously in Boston, a lot more in New York and Philadelphia, uh, but it was still a significant part of the economy. And on the picture over here on the left, we have a picture of John Hancock who was a prominent and wealthy person that we all know as being a signer of the Declaration of Independence. But before that, he was a Bostonian and a very wealthy one, a dandy who liked to dress really well. And he had been accused of smuggling, but he had some very powerful friends who were clever uh, to get him off the hook. So John Adams was his lawyer who defended him when he was accused of smuggling and those charges got dropped. But 
Afterwards, he was able to continue smuggling. And all this allowed for different kinds of tea to continue to come into the American colonies. I'll call this the trickle down economics of the East India Company, because it really did affect every layer of society. But as you might expect, uh, the good times have to come to an end. And we have actually our first case of a company that's too big to fail. Uh, when you study the East India Company on its own, one of the key markers is how it was the first private corporation to get a bailout, as we think about in today's terms. And it's not too hard to understand why it all went down this way. So first we stop and kind of zoom out and think about the East India Company's business model. You have to think that they are trying to meet a massive demand of tea in the colonies, but it's very hard to forecast that. So they keep buying all this tea and they stockpile it and they just keep it on reserve so they can ship it out whenever they need to. Uh, unfortunately, they couple this with uh, harsh tactics that led to exhaustion in the land. And there was just simply bad timing in Bengal when there was a drought. So when you couple the drought that was significant and lasted many seasons, for the agricultural reason, uh, seasons over there, um, and then their harsh, harsh tactics. Uh, about one third of the population in Bengal died. That's about 10 million people who were then struggling and then having to make up the agriculture that the East India Company was trying to keep selling on so they could buy more tea and send it back to the colonies. Uh, if you're an investor in the company, much like today, you would have read the news and instinct read it everywhere. You would have wanted to pull out all your cash, right? Well, the East India Company was so aggressive that they actually continued to meet and surpass their expectations. So they were fine for now, but those European investors had made a wrong way bet and they had met huge bets in the wrong direction. And that actually led to a financial crisis at the time. And you think about how finances worked in the colonial era, there was not much regulation. There was a lot of exposure across different banks. They're all highly concentrated in that risk. And so over the course of 1772, there's actually a credit crisis that picks up and it spreads from Scotland to England to Holland and that concept of contagion. Again, a very modern concept that we can now understand, but back then you don't really realize what's happening and the fear factor and the panic just continues to snowball. And suddenly, this leads to a real problem for the East India Company, because yes, they have their tea, but if the banks that they used to work with no longer have capital, the company can't physically send the tea back to the colonies. It can't access the credit that it needs or the finance that it needs. So eventually, about four years after the famine starts, the East India Company stock price plummets and they need help. They need to get a bailout. And unfortunately, that bailout requires public intervention as well. And when you think about the extent of the bailout that they needed, that's about a million pounds at that time, which was huge. And you couple that with some really bad timing as well. So when you think about the British Empire, at that point, it's led by King George III. Uh, he had just come out of the Seven Years' War that had been going on from 1756 to 1763, so just about 10 years before. You can look on the map. It was a global war. We hear about it in the United States as the French Indian War. That's actually fairly narrow sided uh, when you think about the scale of the fighting that was involved. And when you think of that scale, you think about just how expensive it is. So poor King George had to do something. And that something is what brings us back to the Boston Tea Party. And we see that with the Tea Act of 1773. So yes, there was a bailout for the company. Yes, they get more regulation. But at the same time, the crown needs to put the empire back on sounder footing, put the crown and the company in closer coordination so that the tax revenues from the company can continue to flow more smoothly. And it may be hard to read some of the text over here from the Tea Act itself, uh, but it's actually a pretty straightforward looking document. And it's pretty short. The language is pretty clean. And it essentially allows the East India Company to sell their tea directly back to the colonies. It also gives them a tax break so that they don't have to pay those middle merchants in London and pay a tax when the tea lands. They just have to deal with it once and basically pass the tax back on to the colonists, who, by the way, had already been paying that tax, remember, since 1767. So if I were a minister of parliament, I would think this is a huge win. It would allow for the tea to move more swiftly. It would actually lower the price for American consumers to buy their tea because they wouldn't have to deal with the middlemen anymore. 
all they had to do was pay a tax 20 days after the East India Company tea landed on the colonial shores. Um, but you realize this is actually a fairly narrow scope of the problem. And you can see that the parliamentarians in, in London probably weren't thinking about how all Americans were involved in the tea industry beyond from the consumers. You have to think about the ship owners and the merchants, those middlemen, those are American middlemen who are now out of a job. So you can see that this monopoly that the East India Company has gained actually becomes a monopoly in Boston itself. Because if you think about who are they selling the tea to, that's a choice they get to make. It's a choice they get to make to deal with a very small group of people. So you set up a system of haves and have nots in colonial society through their linkages to the East India Company. So you can see why Samuel Adams and the Sons of Liberty might not be too pleased, uh, especially when you think about this also gets in the way of their smuggling business because once the tea lands on the shores, it's gonna be much harder to smuggle in tea from somewhere else. So when you think about Samuel Adams, uh, he's a fascinating figure. There's a lot written about him. And if we think about his primary complaint with the, the Tea Act of 1773, it's this persistent violation of colonial rights, this consistent taxation without representation. And in this portrait here, it's from 1772, he's pointing at a fairly large piece of paper. This paper is actually the Massachusetts Bay Charter. And it kind of just symbolizes that he's hoping to find a reconciliation to these problems through rule of law not a mob rule and find a logical, reasonable way forward. And then you might wonder if this was the case in 1772, why on earth would they have taken such drastic measures, definitely not rule of law, just one year later. And when you think about who the consignees were, those are the ones receiving the tea from the company and why the governor finally at the end on December 16 itself, didn't listen to their appeal to send the tea back you can tie it directly to the relationship with the East India Company and what triggered the Boston Tea Party that night. And it all comes down to those consignees that we talked about. So let's start at the top. The, the East India Company knew how to do business. They knew how to get in with the powerful folks. That was their business model. So they knew the person to focus on was the governor of Massachusetts, Thomas Hutchinson. And from his point of view, it totally makes sense that the Crown would want to have steady revenues and he would want to support the company. Um, it's also his direct orders from his bosses. So, of course, he'd want to support the company. But then you think about the consignees who were selected by the East India Company. Uh, first, you have the two sons of Governor Hutchinson. So there's conflict of interest, number one. Um, and then there's also another conflict of interest when you realize that Governor Hutchinson had actually invested his own funds into his son's businesses. Then you also have Richard Clark and his family. Uh, no surprise there that they're also relations of Governor Hutchinson a couple of different ways. Then you have Joshua Winslow, shocker, another relation of the Hutchinsons, and also to Richard Clark. And they actually had a direct tie to the company as well with some family working there. And you had Benjamin Faneuil, who was a business partner. So there are a ton of different conflicts of interest. And when you see Sam Adams, working through the course of the tea crisis in late 1773, appealing to the consignees to, to turn back their, their tea, to turn down their contracts, to, the, to this appeal to the governor to send the tea back, you can see why they would be inclined to say, no, thank you, Samuel Adams, we're gonna do this anyways. They had a monopoly on a monopoly. It was going to be extremely lucrative for them. So no surprise that when the tea comes in the middle of November and the tea has to be paid for their taxes on December 17, the Colonial Boston Society has to take action. And that all happens on December 16 itself. And yes, as I mentioned before, the atmospherics in this picture are wildly inaccurate, but they are actually a good representation of what people were talking through, how they were feeling about their rights being infringed. Uh, it wasn't a raucous affair, but they did feel that times were really changing and no one was listening to them. So they had to take dramatic measures. And of course, with an action that's so significant against both Crown and company, it definitely got the British government's attention. It took some time for them to hear about it, but back by early 1774, the British government then starts to impose some very significant acts that cut down on their liberties even further. 
First, of course, for Boston is the Port Act, which basically imposed the blockade around the British port. And there were some other measures as well. Uh, for example, it meant that if you were going to be tried in America, there was a chance that you had to go and stand trial in Britain itself. So clearly you wouldn't have chance for a fair trial. And there were a couple other measures as well, equally aggressive. And so when you think about how things are escalating throughout the course of 1774 and 1775, before those shots rang out in Lexington and Concord in April of 1775, you can, you can trace that line directly back to the Boston Tea Party and how it all changed in Boston and why Boston was the center for most of the fighting and most of the initial resistance. But this is a global perspective that really puts the Boston Tea Party in a new way, but it doesn't actually end at the Boston Tea Party. Uh, it actually continues when you think about the whole history of the American Revolution itself. So if you remember that chart from 1765 where the East India Company had gained their, their fields of influence around the Indian subcontinent, that actually becomes a field of war for the American Revolution itself. So when we think about the American Revolution and we think about the fighting coming to an end in 1781 at Yorktown, that's just the end of the fighting over here in the Americas. It actually keeps going. And the very last battle takes place in June of 1783 off the coast of South India. And that's where the French the French and the British Avies were still vying for, part, for power. And even after the revolution, the connection to the East continues to persist. Because when you think about the revolution with respect to the East India Company, what it really does is break off the monopoly to the trade in the East. So as soon as the revolution is over, American merchants can pick up just where the company left off. And between 1795 and 1805, American trade with India is massive. Again, that demand for tea and Asian goods continues to thrive. And back in 1799, they realized there was so much to take in and so many interesting objects that there's actually an East India Marine Society that gets launched in Salem, Massachusetts. And next time you're in town, you can see what all they brought back so that influence of East and West coming together continues to persist. And when you think about that, you realize that Americans have a very strange relationship with the East India Company because they're first protesting their tea. And then later on, when they're transacting with the Indians to bring those trades and goods back, they're actually transacting with the company and their products. So this is a different way of thinking about American history and the American Revolution. And I hope it's a context that you will carry with you throughout. And I hope it's also going to encourage us to think about what might not be there when we initially read our history books. And I also would encourage people to pick up some historical fiction along the way. And I say this not too selfishly as the author of The Tea Merchant, which I'll get into, but it does allow us to think about history in a new light. So I will talk a little bit about the truth that is available in fiction. Uh, when we think about my novel here, The Tea Merchant, it also offers this global perspective. It offers this question of what might have been the East India Company's plan for America? What might they have been planning? What if they had actually had their tea land on American soil? How would that have changed things? It actually raises more questions than it answers, but I think that's still a helpful tactic for us to think through. And so I'm going to just go through a few different areas of where the tea, the tea merchant actually does talk about the Boston Tea Party and how facts which are not readily available can be explored through this new medium. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the tea merchant itself, as Evan mentioned, it is a story of how Boston uh, is facing the threats of the British East India Company, but it really smushes together the risks from Calcutta and London into Boston. And the key premise is that it's based on a tea merchant, a woman, which is kind of an interesting take to take uh, for historical fiction at this time. And she is a widow and she comes from a loyalist family. So you might suppose then she might be on the side of Thomas Hutchinson and the powerful folks of society. But now that she becomes a widow and takes on her husband's tea business, she actually is not selected by the East India Company as a consignee and needs to supplement her income. So she's kind of caught in between this tension between her position in society and her ability to live out her own life the way she wishes. So she chooses for a time to sign up with John Hancock and the Sons of Liberty and become a smuggler for them to supplement her income. Her timing couldn't have been worse. Uh, at that point, the T Act goes into effect. And in the novel, 
a couple of East India Company officers come into Boston and it's through their networks that she learns that there's actually a much greater risk to the American colonies that might be compared to uh, as face value. And she has to work with her friends in the Daughters of Liberty to deter those risks. And that's the overall premise for the novel. Uh, it is fiction steeped in fact, but there are some you know, fictional liberties that I was able to take and I wanna clear that up right away. Uh, the first is that there were not East India Company officers in Boston to implement the Tea Act. Um, and this is where fiction is actually very helpful because the threat of the company was very real, despite they're not actually being in town to tamp down on smugglers or to implement the Tea Act. And another area that fiction allows us to explore is what was going on in the company itself and its people. And to understand why the company was so aggressive, you have to think about who was forming its officer base. And at that point, most of the company officers were actually Scottish. And you have to also think about what was happening with Scottish history at this time. So for a hundred years or more at that point, the English population and the Scottish population had also been undergoing a lot of tension over who was supposed to be the rightful ruler of the British throne. And finally, in 1746, the Scots were at the losing end of battle at Culloden. They lost the way to live their life and speak their language, dress the way they wanted to. And so they lost a lot of their family fortune and their land. So to make up for it, you would think they were looking for opportunity. They're willing to take risks and they sign up to go be officers in the East India Company. So this company officer that you might see acting aggressively in India is doing it because he literally has no other way to make a name for himself. He's trying to find his own fame and fortune that he can take back with him in a way that wouldn't have been possible. And also you have to think about what was going on in Georgian England. It was a very rigid society, very hierarchical. And if you were a commoner who signed up with the East India Company, you could also make a name for yourself. So by looking into the fiction of these characters, you can understand some of the truth about the East India Company's actions. Another area that we explore in the novel is the Sons and the Daughters of Liberty. And I haven't really brought up the Daughters of Liberty yet. Everyone knows the Sons of Liberty quite well. In the novel, they're fairly well represented. John Hancock, he's kind of a funny character, but in reality, he really was that way. He was very funny. Um, he liked to be a flashy dresser, uh, very witty. They all seem to be very witty at that time. Samuel Adams is kind of at the peak of his powers and, and very stern and kind of reserved. Um, but everyone knows about these two. What people don't really know about is how the Daughters of Liberty supported the Sons of Liberty in their actions. And a great example of that is that I have yet to find a picture of a Daughter of Liberty, a good actual representation of these women who were supporting the Sons in their implementation of their policies. The one whose name we do know is Sarah Bradley Fulton, and she's sometimes called the mother of the Boston Tea Party. And it was really her idea for the, the American colonists to go to Boston Harbor, but also to take precautions so that they weren't recognized. So if you think about the hundreds of men that were participating at Boston Tea Party, they each really only had one or two winter clothes at that time. And you would easily be recognized just on what you're wearing. And it was the Daughters of Liberty who came up with the idea to have them disguise themselves, apply some ash or soot into their faces. And after the tea party was done, it was the daughters who helped them take off their disguises and maintain their anonymity. So they were the ones actually making sure that the Boston Tea Party was successful and that the repercussions weren't against the individuals who were actually participating. And when it came to taking any kind of coercive measure as a colonial society, such as a boycott of tea, it was they who were making sure that the pantries remained dry of tea. And they were trying some other terrible teas to make up for it instead. But no matter how many complaints they got at home, it was they who held the resolve. So we can't forget about the Daughters of Liberty as well and their interaction with the East India Company in recognition of how bad it was for them as well. Another area that we can explore in depth in the novel is how the Boston Tea Party was a representation of America moving in a different path, moving into a different train where it might have been considered America's first civil war. And there are some authors, uh, some historians who take that view of the American Revolution. Um, but if we think back what's happening in 1773, we're not quite there yet. We have loyalists for sure who are loyal to the crown. And then you have non-loyalists. They're not really crying out for independence just yet. 
but it's through the Boston Tea Party and their interaction with the privileged portion of society like the East India Company and the consignees where the marked demarcation between the haves and the have-nots becomes much more pronounced. And in the novel, we just explore that through who has access to the company's favor and who does not. And sometimes these tensions can rise at home. And a good example of that in the novel is Constance, but in reality, that was also the case. And people were put into very challenging situations. And ultimately, some of them just packed up and went back to England, even though they may have been in the American colonies for over a hundred years. So for example, we see on the screen here, the Clark family. We talked about Richard Clark for quite a while as a key merchant. His son was one of the middlemen in London. His other sons got the consignees. But you see the portrait's actually done by John Copley. And you'll see, um, it's actually John Copley who's kind of looking at us in this portrait because he was kind of a young up and coming American who married very well. He married Richard Clark's daughter and entered a new part of society. And unfortunately for him, it was up to Copley who had to defend the family when the Sons of Liberty were asking the consignees to give their posts. They were kind of off in hiding. They didn't really want to deal with the rabble rousers and the Sons of Liberty. So poor Copley, an artist, would have to deal with the full force of John Hancock. And we all think of Copley today in Boston as a pivotal figure. We all know Copley Plaza, we've seen the statue, but Copley actually finished off his days in England. He and the Clarks are buried in England and you can see their gravesides there. It's the same thing for Thomas Hutchinson. He and his family had come to the col colonies back in the early 1600s. Uh, for those of you who really track American history in detail, you might be familiar with Anne Hutchinson, who was a woman in the middle of the 1600s who kind of led the way for women's rights and challenging religious views in colonial society. And she was a direct ancestor of Thomas Hutchinson. He also had to spend out his days in exile in London. So you can see how America was starting to move on this new path. And in the novel, you can see that the East India Company exploits these differences. This is a difference that had already existed, but it was a truth and the power of a medium such as historical fiction that allows us to explore this in more detail. Another area that we explore in the novel is how the Boston Tea Party wasn't just a reflection of Boston society. The, the book does actually move into New York. And that's the reflection of the fact that Boston wasn't the only city where consignees were chosen. Uh, there were consignees chosen along other cities and other key ports in colonial America, particularly Philadelphia, New York, and Charleston. Each of these cities had their own version of the Boston Tea Party. In Philadelphia, uh, in October of 73, um, we're actually just past that, that's 250th anniversary, they passed their own resolutions to turn back the tea, and that served as an inspiration to the people of Boston. Uh, and then in late December, they had their own Boston Tea Party, and where they were able to convince the ship owners to send the tea back. Charleston had the same thing back in early December of 1773. Uh, some people in Charleston would say that they had the first tea party I think it's a little bit different because the Tea Party did not actually result in any tea in the harbor. Uh, they were able to seize and store their tea. They did dump some tea later on in 1774, but I think the claim still falls on Boston for the actual destruction of the tea. And it's the same case in New York, where these are the two characters that we explore in The Tea Merchant. Um, and you have one person, Captain Sears, who is from Massachusetts, and then Captain McDougal, who is from Scotland. And you can see different different groups of people coming together and reacting to the East India Company in very different ways. But these two people were also very involved in New York's own Boston Tea, or their own uh, New York Tea Party. And they had been also successful in sending back some 700 cases of tea. So you think about what kind of distress was going along colonial America. And it wasn't just a Boston Tea Party. It was the entire colonial society that was reacting to the East India Company in the way that we think about taking place in Boston. And last and definitely not least, when we think about how the East India Company could have had a different kind of model and business model with the American colonies, we have to think about opium. And this is a little bit of a surprise that people wonder why am I talking about opium when we're talking about a tea party and we're talking about the British East India Company. Um, there's actually a direct link to tea and opium, which was not very well documented at that time. But when you start to explore through the documentation of when tea started to grow in India, 
and how the business model of the East India Company was operating, you realize it's also a direct link. So tea actually didn't grow in India until the middle of the 1800s. So when you think about the British, British East India Company and their tea, it's actually two different geographies that we're talking about. We're talking about their operations in India and their purchase of tea from China. And fortunately, the company discovered in the late 1700s that they could grow opium in India and use that to gain significant profit and buy their tea in China. And at that point, people had known about opium for thousands of years. It had been used for medicinal purposes to ease pain. It was very helpful when soldiers were recovering from conflict for surgery. And things start to change when the company starts growing more and more of it particularly in 1767, when we start to see that their trade of opium from Calcutta to China starts increasing significantly. We know that at that point that the opium that was sailing from the Bay of Bengal into China was dominated by the East India Company, and they were shipping some 2,000 chests of that every single year. And then things, things change even more in 1773, when the company gets control over opium cultivation in Bengal. And it makes you wonder what might have happened if the company decided to use that opium to start transacting with the American colonies. You think about the year that this is happening. It's 1773. It's the very same year as the Boston Tea Party. It's the same year that the company is starting to make contracts with American merchants. And we know the company is not above using their monopoly over opium to get what they want. So when you think about the American colonies and what they were growing, tobacco, sugar, cotton, lumber. Could that have meant that the company would have been using opium as well in their transactions to help balance the flow of their trade? Uh, would that have meant that the company then also wished to defend their interests in the Americas like they were doing in Asia through a military force? And how might that have changed world history? So unfortunately, I have no answers for you on that front, but I will say I was honest with you all up front when I said I had more questions than answers. But I do hope that these are the kinds of questions that you will carry with you. And I'm curious to hear from you as well tonight, I'll move on to the next screen, um, on how these questions have been shaping your view of American history. I'm curious, what, if anything, surprised you most today as you learned about this interaction between colonial society and the East India Company? What changed your impression of colonial America and its politicians and its merchant classes and its consumers? What do you think might have happened if the East India Company had gained a foothold? And as Evan mentioned earlier, we have a very large group with us today, and we have a diversity in our participation. I'm very glad to see that. And I'm also curious, what brought you here today? How, how has this conversation tonight affected you or changed your thinking about world history? And I know these are some really big questions. I'm excited to get into some of them, um, but we probably won't be able to get into all of them, or you may have questions that keep coming up. So I do encourage everyone to connect with me on social media. My information is down below. So if you have a question that you'd like to get into, whether today or tomorrow or even further down the road, I'm definitely available and I look forward to learning from you as well. So with that, I'll turn it back to Evan. Great. Well, thank you so much, Lena. Um, outstanding information, outstanding talk. And, you know, this story of the Boston Tea Party truly was global. And I think the lead up to it um, and the lasting legacy of this event was demonstrated incredibly well during your remarks. And I can't thank you enough for bringing your expertise, your knowledge, your passion for this subject with us. And I know you opened my eyes tonight, and I'm sure you opened up the eyes of the audience. And we're really grateful uh, for your remarks and the information this evening. So thank you so much. Um, as expected, uh, the Q&A feature on Zoom is popping right now. So um, all of you who are at home listening, please ask your questions, use the Q&A feature, and we'll try to go through this as much as we can. And I'm happy to uh, moderate this. So um, let's start with, this is a, a great question here. Um, Jerry is asking, first of all, he says, great talk. Um, how did the loss of the American colonies affect the East India Company? I think you mentioned that after the war, American merchants trading in India were actually trading with the company. That's right. So it's it's an interesting evolution. Uh, when the American colonists are free from the monopoly of the company, they're able to compete with them and then transact with them directly too. So 
that connection between East and West actually continues for hundreds of more years. And American colonists pick right back up when the East India Company is out of the way. And in the 1790s, they start transacting significantly uh, with other opium producers, actually. So when you think about how many New England families were gaining their wealth, they were able to bring back Asian goods, particularly Chinese goods, by first stopping over in Turkey and in India, where the East India Company had been growing all their opium. So there are some very prominent names in American history that we know about today, and we think of them building their fortunes based off fur and lumber, um, but that's just kind of the nice story. If you think about how actually New England really made their bucks, they went through opium, and it wasn't in the same way that we think about it from the opium wars. Um, it was much more indirect. It wasn't that same kind of active administration, but they were definitely involved with it. And another thing to think about is that the East India Company itself underwent a huge revolution itself after 1773. Uh, they became subject to oversight. So when we think about a bailout, we, we usually think about uh, the oversight that a company might get from the government, not in addition to the funds, kind of the quid pro quo that you might see when you're getting a traditional corporate bailout. And that was the case here too. So what happens is that the Americans start working with this now quasi government, private, public East India Company. And what that means actually is that the East India Company is much larger. It continues to keep growing in the Indian subcontinent and it keeps going that way for about another hundred years. So it's actually by 1857 when the East India Company has gotten so large and so vast in the East India um, subcontinent itself that American traders who continue to transact are doing it through the company in its new form. Um, that's actually pretty significant when you think about the American cotton industry uh, and you think about what was going on with cotton cultivation in the American South. I, I believe that some 75% of global cotton was actually produced in the American South eventually. And then that was making its way around the world. And when it comes to cotton cultivation, they started building that up in Bengal as well. So when the Civil War actually hits, it's a change for the Industrial Revolution that Americans have to now close off their economy and deal with their own economic integration, while the East India Company and the British people now have to find cotton from elsewhere. So this link between commerce and the East and West keeps on going for hundreds of years. It just takes on new forms, essentially as the East India Company becomes too big to manage and undergoes different kinds of regulation from time to time. Great, thank you so much. Uh, Robert asks, why did the East India, well, why didn't the East India Company wage war in Boston after the Tea Party if they had an independent army and a right to wage war? That's a good question. That is a great question. Um, I actually don't know the answer to that one. My hunch would be that there are two factors at play. Um, one is that the British military, the actual government, had a sizable force in Boston at that point. Uh, and with the Port Act that closed off the Port of Boston, I've assumed that the military force would have increased even more. I don't have the particular numbers in front of me, but the official government had a, a large force already on the ground here. And when you think about a private corporation, you're thinking about the trade-off between your investment and your profit. And how much more could a private company have gotten if they were investing in a military force on the American continent when the Brits were already here, when in fact they could have gone to the East and instead taken advantage of a declining empire that had riches galore ready to be exploited. So I think it was actually a pretty practical uh, choice that their leadership might have made to say, let's focus on the East where no one's really looking at us and we can continue to be as hard as we want to. Great. Thank you. Uh, Ken asks, did the Silk Road play an active role in the East India trade at all? In a way, it did. It's actually fascinating to think about what triggered uh, the sea route that all the Europeans were looking for. So I mentioned that, you know, in the late 1400s, the Portuguese under Vasco da Gama, they found that sea route to India. And the question for why they needed a sea route was that the ancient Silk Road that we all know about, especially the land route, had actually become closed off to the West. And this is another way of why global perspectives matter. And when you think about what was happening in the 1400s, 
the Ottoman Empire was starting to grow and starting to gain power. The Crusades had been raging on already. And so Europeans weren't as easily able to access their trade route along the traditional Silk Road. So it's with this direct sea route, they get to avoid all of that. And they just get to park their ships directly along the ports of the Indian subcontinent themselves. So it was definitely a reaction to the Silk Road no longer being there. Thank you. Uh, Ian says, I really enjoyed reading your book, and I noticed William Dalrymple is one of the references. Do you currently listen to the Empire podcast? And also, how much did the colonists in America know about the Great Bengali Famine of 1770, and did the colonists think that they could be next? Great questions. Uh, so William Dalrymple is someone who I follow very closely. Um, I'm not a podcaster, so unfortunately I don't listen to the podcast, but I do follow their works. Uh, I know he works in the Empire Co podcast with a couple of other folks, um, and they take a fantastic globalistic approach to different events in world history. And I will say, when I was traveling in Calcutta, it was his book on the company that had just come out and kind of triggered me to think about this global perspective of history. So I definitely pay attention to what he does. Um, and in his novel, and actually it's not novel, his actual book that had come out about the corporation, um, he does make it clear that people in Boston knew what was going on. People in the colonies were tracking what the, co what the company was up to. They may not have known the full extent of it, but there are direct quotes from colonial Americans that they didn't want to be next. Uh, I don't know to what extent they realized just how terrible the practices of the company were. It was hard for information to get out there. Um, but I think they had a sense that the company's tactics were pretty crude. Uh, again, some of them had family working as officers in the company itself and knew firsthand what it was capable of. But I don't think that there was this widespread, you know, hysteria in the colonies that we could have been the next subjugates of a private corporation. I don't think it was quite at that point yet. Um, and to be frank, I don't know if it would actually even get to that point just because the dynamics of the local governments had been so different and the crown had been much more involved in the Western hemisphere at that point already. So for the company to have taken that kind of Indian business model to the Americas would have required quite many more changes than we were, when we saw in the Indian subcontinent for them to happen. Thank you. So an anonymous attendee asks, what did you see in India that inspired you to write the book? Absolutely. So uh, there is a massive monument in Calcutta, which is where I was traveling, um, and it's called the Victoria Memorial. I think it's the largest memorial to a monarch, because when you go in, it's just absolutely huge. Um, and Calcutta was a key city for the British Empire and a key city for the East India Company. That's where their headquarter was. And I never really thought about the connection until I went into the Victoria Monument. So again, it was supposed, supposed to be for the crown, who I was going to go and see what this monument was all about. And in the main room was this massive statue of Robert Clive. And as an American, I was completely thrown off as to why he might be in there. Um, it almost felt like having your colonial overlords, overlords being in the middle of Central Park rather than, you know, kicked off from like Boston. So it was a strange juxtaposition of seeing a company man right up there with Queen Victoria. And there was so much about company history in Calcutta that was being explored. They were talking about why the company came into Calcutta, how they were growing and sinking their foothold in the Indian subcontinent. But my own background is that I really was introduced to the company growing up in Massachusetts. That's the first time I heard about it. So first time I see this massive statue of a corporate overlord, and then I see what he was doing in the East when I've only heard about him in the West. And you couple that with William Dalrymple's book that had just come out, talking about the company and applying this global perspective, that's when the light bulb went off for me. That's when I realized that there is a connection here that people don't really talk about it. And I don't have all the information because I don't think it all exists, but I think this was a moment where I really wanted to get that connection out there. And so that's what really triggered me almost four years to the day for the idea to take place. Well, that's great. You know, and it's so important to find that personal connection with everything. That's what we do this for, you know, and I think your book and your talk tonight has allowed us that personal connection with, with your history. And thank you for sharing that with us today.
So uh, keep the questions coming, friends. There's some great stuff here. Let's see. Um, uh, Alexis, uh, you just asked if we can get a copy of the slides. Uh, absolutely. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and all of you who attend tonight will be getting an email from me in a few days uh, with a copy of this great program. So thank you so much. Uh, Michael M asks, thank you, Lena. Uh, you mentioned the company buying seats in parliament. Could you please speak a bit more about divisions within parliament over the company's bailout and voting on the T Act of 1773? Perhaps there was a broad division between the majority Tories and minority Whigs, with the former being more heavily invested in the company and the latter not. So I haven't explored the deep intricacies of parliamentary politics in the 1770s, but what is definitely apparent is that the company was actually using their proceeds to buy politicians, to buy their own seats in parliament. I understand these are called rotten boroughs, and it's a concept that extends beyond the company, just basically extends to anyone who could buy a seat in favor. And the extent to which that influenced the debate for the Tea Act, um, I think it just is how we all see conflicts of interest today, where vested interests are, where constituencies matter. And each person in parliament will be thinking about what do their people want. And if you have a constituency that is actually just one large company backer, that will influence how they think about this. Uh, I haven't really thought about how the particular parties played through it, um, but I do think it is a, a una unanimous view of the T Act that Parliament probably thought they were having a huge win in passing the T Act with this kind of language. It is very carefully crafted. If you read it, um, it kind of buries the lead that the tax remains, that this all is going to change the way that the company does their business, but only at the end do you realize like, wait a minute, that 3% tax on the tea is actually still there. No one's changing it. Um, it's very technical in thinking about who gets to be the consignee, how the drawback works on the duty and the, and the tax in London. Um, but they knew what they were doing. They were very careful and deliberate about it. And I think they thought it may not have gotten such a strong blowback because at the end of the day, the middlemen being cut out of the process, that tax being cut out in the middle of the process lowered the price of tea. So at the end of the day, it actually supports the company even more because they were thinking that they were going to be able to sell all their tea and do away with the smugglers. So I don't know how much of a two-sided debate it was. Um, just as someone reading the text, it seems like a win for everyone who was involved with the company. Kind of like those terms and conditions things. You know, you don't read all the way to the bottom and then you realize you're still signing yourself up for the three pence per pound tax. So um, <laughs> um, let's see. Sue asks, I always thought that the non-importation agreements on tea had a major impact on the financial crisis of the East India Company. Was that a factor? I think it had some effect, um, but it all really came down to implementation. And from what I know, Boston was perhaps the, the kindest in terms of its rule following ways. And I think that's something that is a legacy that stands in how we think of Bostonians today. Uh, but if you couple that with what was happening in New York and in Philadelphia, smuggling was huge. And so when you think about how much revenues would have been lost through non-importation, it really would have just meant more business was being diverted to smugglers. And so much of that was already happening in New York and in Philadelphia and in Charleston. So I think eventually if that non-importation agreement had persisted, it may have made some changes, particularly in Boston, because they actually would have had to change how they transact. But again, given the social construct of Boston politics and how they're all linked to the companies, it would have taken a lot for that to actually happen. Um, so it's a matter of timing as well. Like if it had continued for several years, absolutely. But I honestly don't think colonial Americans in Boston could have waited that long. I agree with that assessment. Um, so this is kind of a two-parter between Yvette and Ken. Um, so Ken is asking, what became of the East India Company? Is it still a company? Was it taken over, swallowed up under a new name, acronym? And Yvette also asks, what do you think about the revival of the East India Company? Yeah, I'll admit, when I first started researching this book, I thought the East India Company had gone completely underground. Uh, so I knew that over the next 100 years until 1857, in India, they were much more aggressive. And then there was a local uprising in India in 1857, which basically meant that the British government was going to take over their operations. I thought that was it. 
I thought the company was done. It's all been subsumed as a public corporation and it's, you know, terror practices were over and done with. It seems like that was the case for their bad practices, but it seems like actually a small vestige of the company remained. And I only really realized that when I learned the East India Company was back and partnering with you to reclaim the history and acknowledge what all they did and even donate their tea to willingly participate in the festivities this December. So I didn't realize how things had happened, but it does seem like the company is obviously now a normal company. Um, they're subject to rules and regulations just like everybody else. So that that actually has been a journey for me that your institution has helped me learn. Yeah, thank you. Um, and, and I'll jump in here as well to say that um, when I first began doing significant research into the Boston Tea Party, I was also shocked that the East India Company was still around uh, in some vestige of its former form. Um, and yeah, as Lena said, as we uh, get ready for the 250th anniversary of the Tea Party, our, our museum, as well as Revolution 250, another you know, partner organization, has been working with uh, the East India Company out of London. Uh, they are much smaller now, um, but they, as Lena said, have worked diligently to reclaim this history, to acknowledge their role in it, um, and also do what they can uh, to make up for some of that impact that you heard about today, and also embrace the future uh, in collaboration and in partnership with organizations like ours and really not shy away from their role in the story and shy away from history. So to kind of kick off a new era and a new partnership with us, uh, as Lena said, they have donated 250 pounds of tea willingly uh, uh, to go into our tea chest, which will be part of a grand scale reenactment on the 16th of December, where we will throw East India Company tea back into Boston Harbor. And uh, some employees of the East India Company may be coming to Boston uh, as well to take part and, and to watch this. Um, I had the honor of traveling to London uh, with the Boston Tea Party Ships and Museum team and Revolution 250 and representatives from the city of Boston just a few weeks ago. Uh, we met um, in September on the anniversary of the Dartmouth uh, departing the East India docks, bringing the cursed East India Company tea. And it was remarkable to see Londoners' interest in this um, and all kinds of great questions. And I think to Lena's whole premise tonight, this is a global story that really impacted people around the world. And this is an amazing opportunity for all of us to uh, take a look at our own basic understanding of these stories, understand that some of those myths we might have believed uh, that need to be broken and take a look, a long look um, at our own role in history and um, how we can continue to do a better job at making sure that our history is as accessible as possible, as true as possible, um, and as inclusive as possible. So it was a remarkable thing for us to be invited to London and take part in this event. And, you know, we're looking forward to throwing that tea in the harbor uh, once again. They have a great sense of humor about it, by the way. Um, let's see, we're running a little low on time here, but a couple really great questions. And also, you know, Lena asked a, a few great questions of all of you, you know, what brought you here tonight? Um, and, you know, what, do the, what does this story mean to you? Um, oh, and Yvette just chimed in too, that uh, Yvette saw me in London. Hello again, Yvette, <laughs> good to see you uh, virtually. Um, let's see here. So, um, do, 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 do. I want to make sure we get the good questions in here. Okay, so another anonymous attendee says, "Hi, Lena. I'm a patient uh, safety professional, and I'm currently a healthcare at a healthcare conference. And a hot topic of change needed is educational reform for current healthcare students and future leaders to be trained and educated in patient safety and quality improvement early in their careers. So, regarding your novel and how nicely you've tied in the events and the impacts and global ramifications of the East India Company." Do you have any recommendations for educators on improving how history is taught in early education, especially to promote more discussion, mindfulness, and being more strategic thinkers? Thank you. That is a great question. Um, and I think it all comes back to our initial point from tonight, which is to approach history with questions, to keep an open mind, and for us to think about unconventional ways where information might reach us. So. If we're traveling in one part of the world and something rings a distant bell and tug at that string a little bit, 
find out why you're making that connection. And then also be open to exploring why that connection might exist in the first place. It does sometimes raise some challenging questions and, and that might include also how we think about this and how we teach this to children. Um, the Boston Tea Party is an event that is usually taught fairly early on in our educational careers. Um, and the first time I learned about it, I think it was five or six years old in Boston. And you can bet that I didn't want to know what the East India Company was doing in India and all their drug dealings on the side that they eventually would get into. So it does also come down to how do we take all this information and think about it with nuance? How do we think about it neutrally? Um, how do we also think about it fairly? Um, because facts keep changing, new information does keep coming out. Um, it took some time for me to kind of think about the new East India Company from a position of impartiality, uh, especially having so much of my own family in India as well and having seen how the East India Company shaped the course of world history uh, to then pause and take a minute and appreciate the facts for what they are and just see that they are trying to take control of the narrative. So maybe I should try to reassess what they're doing now. So it's a continual conversation about questioning the information, where it comes from, how you receive it, how we deliver it, and challenging the sources that keep providing that to us. Um, and also just being open to new sources of information. Again, The Tea Merchant is a historical fiction novel. It's not a traditional place of learning, um, but it is something that I talk about with historians and economists and world travelers and foodies all over the world. And you have different mediums and different ways for people to come together. So just be open to that, I would say. Absolutely. And those types of stories is how I got my start and my passion for history and in New England's history. And we have to start with that and whatever connection we can build um, to, to get people interested in these topics and, and dedicate their life and their passions to this. I, I applaud you. And I cannot wait to read the novel as well. Um, so I think before we conclude tonight, um, one last question here from Alka. Uh, Lena, you mentioned the connection between the American Revolution, Britain, and India continues past the Boston Tea Party in 1773. My understanding that the American Revolution partly concluded after the conclusion of the anglo mysore Wars and death of Tipu Sultan in 1799. Could you set, shed some light on that at all? It's an interesting thread to keep following. So when you think about the theater of war and how American history continues to be really evolutionary in its early phases. So we're thinking about American Revolution ending in 1783, but the fighting, I think a lot of people would say really doesn't end until like the War of 1812, right? That's when American independence is finally you know, reaffirmed, stamped, done, we are here. Uh, there, there are connections with the East throughout all of that. So you have the direct link to the, to the East Indies uh, through the war in the revolution. Again, I mentioned the Battle of Kudalore, the very last battle of the revolution took place off the coast of South India. The people fighting in South India were actually under the ruler Tipu Sultan. Before that, his father, Hyder Ali, and they had been fighting fiercely. Um, and then you think about how the East India Company was continuing to fight, continuing to gain influence. This was something that the Americans also took notice of all the way through that early history, including the War of 1812. So for example, um, it was Tipu Sultan who the Brits finally defeated back in 1799. What that meant was they were able to not only gain access to his land, but also to their technology. So we mentioned earlier on that a lot of Indian empires at that point were at their peak. That was definitely the case for their warfighting technique. And there were these rockets that Tipu Sultan was using throughout his whole warfighting campaign. That comes back directly to the War of 1812. And in fact, when we think about the Star Spangled Banner, we think about those rockets those are rockets based off of technology from Tipu Sultan. You can draw that link back again. So when you start seeing this cross mixing of culture and history and trade and the economics all coming together, it really does continue beyond the revolution and definitely you see it in the early 19th century. Great, thank you so much. And another, another anonymous attendee has one question about your books. Any sequels planned by any chance? <laughs> 
There, there are. Um, I'm very focused right now on celebrating the 250th of the Boston Tea Party itself. Um, but like I mentioned, the connection to Asia continues, and that's the thread that I'm going to continue to tug at. And the next thing that I'm looking at is what happens in 1783 when the war is actually concluding. And when you think about this global perspective on American history, a key thing to keep in mind for the revolution is that the Brits didn't sign just one treaty. They signed a few of them. And if you start reading them, particularly the one that the Brits signed with the French, there were all these different articles in them, but many of them, I think almost a quarter or half of them relate to India and their exposure to trading posts in India and exchanges of land that they can have there. So just another example of finding unexpected connections and just being on the lookout for them. So stay tuned. It'll take some time, but I hope to get there soon. Great. Thank you so much. And just as we conclude tonight, I also want to give a shout out to Michael, who's saying that he's going to be in Boston for December 16th. Very excited about that. Amanda, a descendant of Joshua Wyeth, a Boston Tea Party participant. Just an incredible audience tonight. Thank you all at home uh, watching for your great questions and your enthusiasm and your passion. And Lena, as well, your, your passion is incredible. And we really learned a lot tonight. Thank you so much for making yourself available, for being part of this. Um, this has been one of the best talks we've had this entire commemorative year. And I think we all learned a tremendous amount. So thank you so, so much for being here tonight. Friends, before we sign off for the evening, I will go ahead and share my screen one more time because uh, as I said a few minutes ago, we've got a big anniversary coming up. And I also want to make sure uh, that you go out in however you can find Lena's book, buy Lena's book. Um, it's a phenomenal novel, and uh, you can buy it here at the Boston Tea Party Ships and Museum or wherever books are sold. So please go out there, support Lena, um, and buy Lena's book. And last but not least, um, if you are unable to come to Boston for December 16th, uh, we would love you to travel to the city, but we understand. Uh, if you're not able to come, you can still participate in the 250th Boston Tea Party anniversary and reenactment by sending us your loose leaf tea. Um, you mail it to the Boston Tea Party Ships and Museum, 306 Congress Street, Boston, Mass. Attention, Boston Tea Party 250. If you mail us your loose leaf tea, we will put it inside the tea chest and it will be thrown into Boston Harbor as part of the grand celebration and commemoration that night. For your generous donation of tea, you will receive a certificate of participation. So make sure that your name and mailing address are included with that shipment of tea. We are receiving on average right now about 50 packages of tea a day from all over the world. A school in Tunisia just uh, messaged me yesterday saying that their tea is in the mail heading to Boston. We've received tea from all but two states in the US and multiple other countries around the world as well. So it's a great way for you, your family, um, any classes, uh, if you're a teacher listening tonight, a great way for your class to be involved in the reenactment. Last but not least, speaking of teachers and students, um, we are looking for all of you out there, hardworking students who are studying this topic right now to participate in this commemorative year through essays, artwork, painting, poetry, dioramas, sculptures, videos, send them to us at bostonteaparty250.org. We are working on a free virtual exhibit showcasing your talents, your passion, your artwork for the entire world to see. So throughout the remainder of the school year, all the way into 2024, if you go to bostonteaparty250.org, you can upload your artwork upload your poetry and essays, and we will share that with the general public. It's a great way for you, again, to be involved in this very important anniversary. And so on behalf of all of us here, again, at the Boston Tea Party, Ships and Museum, all of our partner organizations, uh, Lena, again, I want to thank you so much for being part of this commemorative year with us today and giving a great presentation. And for all of you at home, thank you for giving us your time tonight. As I said, this webinar is being recorded and you'll be receiving an email from yours truly in just a few days uh, sharing all of that. So Lena, again, thank you so much for being here tonight. Did you have fun? Thank you for having me. I had a blast. I'm so glad everyone got to share me on this journey with me.
Well, thank you again. And yes, please reach out to Lena as well. She made that offer earlier on tonight. And for all of us here at the Boston Tea Party Ships and Museum, you can also reach out to us for any questions about the upcoming anniversary. BostonTeaParty250.org. You can find all the information about December 16th. Well, again, thank you all so very much and have a wonderful evening. Bye-bye.